But I learned a little bit about myself. I learned that number one, I like to write. And number two, that once I started a novel, I knew I actually had it in me to finish it. So that was good. So I remember going back to college for my sophomore year, and I, I chose my major, business finance. And I uh, didn't write another thing for the next three years. Now, when I was uh, graduating, I had a pretty good plan. And you know, I, all, I love talking to college students because hardly any of them know what they're going to do. And the ones who do, don't believe them because it's going to change, by the way. Um, but I remember when I was in college, I knew that I was going to go to law school. That was my big thing. I was going to go to law school. You know, I'd done real well in my logic classes. You know, I'd written this book. I felt I could write things. You know, I'd watch all those episodes of Perry Mason when I was a kid. I knew all the tricks that everything, everyone would do. So I thought I'd be a pretty good lawyer. And it was a pretty good plan, except for one thing. And that was that I didn't get accepted to any law schools. So I graduated, and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I sat down and I wrote a second novel, The Art of Killing Time. This was not a love story. This was a murder mystery. At the time, I was reading a lot of Agatha Christie. So that's what I did. Now, neither of these first two novels, uh, you know, I, I didn't ever think they'd get published. I never even really submitted them. I kind of wrote them just to see if I could write them. So, let's see, I graduated at 22, and I, the whole law school thing was out. I didn't know what I was going to do, so I spent the next three years trying all sorts of things. Let's see, I, um, I waited tables, I um, sold, I, I appraised real estate, I bought and sold very inexpensive real estate property, I sold dental products by phone. <laughs> I started and failed in my own business. And then I started and failed in a, in a second business. By then I was coming up on 26 years old and my wife, um, she gave me some very good advice. She said to me, Nick, get a job. So, uh, so I did, I took a job selling pharmaceuticals. Pharmaceuticals. So, did that for a couple of years, and when I was 28, I had an epiphany. A life-changing moment for those without high verbal SAT scores. <laughs> had an epiphany. Like, we all remember certain moments in our life. Like, there's a chance, for instance, that you remember where you were when 9-11 hit, right? For older people, they, they, they might remember when the day Kennedy was assassinated, or when I was in college, when, when the Challenger exploded. You know, these big, indelible moments. Well, in May 1994, there was another one of those indelible moments. And uh, I know most of you were young when this happened, but uh, it was pretty traumatic, because what happened was, and I know you probably, it's amazing. Um, anyway, the last episode of Cheers aired on television. <laughs> yeah, you remember, right? It was, it was awful. It was awful. Anyway, I stayed awake all night long that night. I'm not joking. I know I'm a writer that can be a little odd at times. Um, I was very upset by this. I, and, but it wasn't because I loved the show so much. And now, many of you are in college, but believe me, you will begin to relate to this when I tell you this part of the story. Now, that show, Cheers, had started and first aired on television when I was a high school sophomore. I was a high school sophomore. And by the time it ended, I was 28 years old. And a lot of things had changed in my life in that, you know, 12 and a half year run of Cheers. I mean, I got my driver's license, got my first job, I graduated high school, I graduated college, I met a girl, I got married, I moved across the country, I, eat, I bought a house, had children, and even got a job. Lots of things had happened. But, 
I couldn't help but think back to when I was a high school sophomore. And I remember that when I was a sophomore, I had big dreams for myself. You know, back then I thought, you know, the world was there for the taking. At the time, my dream was to go to the Olympics. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to the Olympics, I wanted to win a gold medal. Of course, I never did. But by the time I was 28, I realized that although I was living my life, I wasn't chasing dreams anymore. And that bothered me. Then I got to thinking, how many 12-year periods do you get in your whole life? Six? Seven? Eight? You don't get that many. And I said to myself that night that I never wanted to have another 12-year period go by where I had, a, I had dreams at the beginning and no dreams left at the end. So I said, okay, I have to chase a dream. What can I do? What can I do? Now, my wife and I had been married a few years. We had a, a couple of kids at the time, so I, it wasn't as if I could quit my job and go climb Mount Everest or something. I was kind of limited on my options. But I said, I know what I'll do. I will try writing again. But this time, I'm going to give it a real shot. I'm going to give it 100% effort. So then I said, all right, what am I going to write? Well, let's go back in time to 1989. Actually, before that. Growing up, my wife had one set of grandparents that she was close to. The other set of grandparents had died when she was very young, so she didn't know them. Now, they only lived about 20 miles away from the house, so consequently, my wife spent a lot of time with them. You know, every holiday, obviously, every birthday, lots of weekends, family trips. She grew up with this set of grandparents. Um, they were very close to her. She loved them very much. When she turned 16, she would uh, drive up there and see how they were doing. Even when she went off to college, she would go and just check on them, make sure they had food, make sure they had everything they needed. Well, in 1989, when we were to be married, my wife wanted these grandparents to be part of the ceremony. Not a, not a big part, you know, just come in with the family, you know, with the corsage and the boutonniere, sit in the front row, the whole bit, just be part of the celebration. Well, the day before the wedding, we got a call from the grandparents. And they said that, unfortunately, they would not be able to attend the wedding. They were in just such ill health that they couldn't make it. And you know, this is, remember, they only lived about 20 minutes away by car. So even if someone would, was willing to drive up and pick them up, which they were, they just said that they couldn't do this. Now, my wife was very brokenhearted about but in the hustle and bustle of weddings, you know, things happen. I don't think it really hit home for my wife until after the ceremony. We were walking out of the church, and in the back of the church is this little table on it. It's a cardboard table. And on this cardboard table was a box. And this was the box that had been brought by the florist. You know, it had the bridal bouquet, it had all the corsages, the boutonnieres. And in that box were the two flowers, the corsage and the boutonniere that had been meant for the grandparents. Well, you know, it's very busy, you know, we still have things to do, so we went off to the reception and all of this, and we went to the hotel that night, and when we woke up in the morning, my, my lovely wife, she rolled over to me and batted her pretty green eyes, and she said, Nick, do you love me? I said, well, of course I do, baby. Why, your peaches are green. And she said, okay, then you're going to do something for me. I said, okay. What she asked me to do essentially 
was to uh, put on my tuxedo again. So I did. And my wife then slipped into 